Well, welcome back again. It's been another year, and um, I'm with my dear brother and friend, Abalone Kid. Give me a baby. Oh, yeah. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Yeah. It's good been, to see you. Oh, yeah. It's been a year since I spoke to the Abalone Kid, and um, I'm sure many of you saw the interview. You haven't and, missed anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But here we are again, another interview. So I just yeah. wanted to speak to him about his music and um, his ministry and uh, what's going on um, right now, and um, yes. here we are again. So... Well, last time we were talking about your music, and we were talking about you being in the office, and um, and um, how a lot of the music came about. Um, talk about John Hammond Sr., because I know that he was a legendary music producer who offered you a contract somewhere around 1984, 1985. Um, elaborate on that for me. Yes. Well, uh, in a, in a, in the context of of scripture, which of course I've learned in retrospect when I look back on my life. I realized that God's hand was was upon me well before I ever knew God and started reading the Bible. And the scripture tells us that we're known to God before we're in our mother's womb. Mm -hmm. We're predestined and we're chosen and we're called and we're one of his elect, whether we be Gentile or Jew. Mm -hmm. I just happen to be uh, of the Jewish uh, background and I am one of his elect as you are. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing to me was when I was dealing with the music industry and singing in the cabaret in New York City and had a very good act going with some terrific musicians. Mm -hmm. One guy played with with uh, Michael Jackson and uh, uh, Miles Davis and another guy that I played with who was a guitarist was lead guitar with Billy Joel mm -hmm. and another chap played with uh, uh, Bette Midler and uh, Mariah Carey mm -hmm. Well, here are all these guys, and we're playing in the cabaret in, on the east side in Manhattan and scoring, you know, and, and drawing a, a full house. And years later, when I thought about it, I said to myself, this is the most amazing thing. God took me and gave me music and gave me songs to, to write, put me on the stage only to take me off the stage right at the point where I was going to break through mm -hmm. and let me meet a man like John Hammond Sr., mm. who was the talent scout in the record industry for Columbia Records, who discovered Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and all of the great jazz greats of the 20th century, and had me in his office with a contract that was offered to me by Mr. Hammond and then closed the door on that as well <laughs> and then he had me with Columbia Records and a woman who was the only woman to sit on the board of directors of CBS mm -hmm. and she wanted to produce me she was retiring from Columbia and had the entire Columbia apparatus at her disposal and when she went to the doctor one day and had her last physical on Columbia she was paying the bill at the doctor's desk at a full and clean bill of health and she dropped dead right at the desk in the doctor's office well so what is my point my point is that for all of us God has been in our lives and protected us and overshadowed us and led us and closed doors and opened doors because we were his mm -hmm. and he knew us before we knew him he chose us before we knew him mm. and he will bring to fruition mm. and into the faith every one of us who is in the faith now is in the faith because God called us before the world was made amen amen brother amen so um what about the fact that you were a lawyer, big shot lawyer in New York City? How did that go? I mean, how, how did that affect your spiritual life? Um, yeah, well, this is another, thank you, this is another example of the same principle. So in the law practice, I had the opportunity to, uh, to study and be trained, to read and spend hours and hours and days in the law library, to, to uh, hone my mind and my memory in order to be able to be a successful trial attorney which I turned out to be and just at the point at 38 at the point where I was I had been published a book of mine that I, that I was asked to write was in Harvard and Yale and Columbia and the judges were reading them 
I'd go into court in the trial, and in the middle of the trial, if there was a question that arose, the judge would say, Mr. Bass, what's the answer? <laughs> I mean, it got crazy. My adversary would just, like, sink. <laughs> but just at that point where I was ready for the big bucks, I was ready. I mean, I was dreaming of dollar signs at night. <laughs> Hit God, the lottery. God pulled me slowly but surely from my law practice. Mm. And I remember one day calling my, my poor mother, Esther, my, my blessed mother. She was such a wonderful woman. Oh, mm. my mother loved me so much. She took care of me. I never would have made it without her. I couldn't even spell, you know. She got me through school and she didn't go through junior high school. Mm. She was a fabulous woman. She wrote poetry. She loved music. That was one of the reasons I came out singing. Mm. She used to play all the classics <laughs> while I was in the womb. Yeah. Anyway, the um, I called my mother in California and said, Mom, I'm not going to be, be staying in this law practice too much longer. She said to me, like, why, Howie? What's what's going on with you? You know, you, you, you've you made it. You, you're ready to, to, to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mom, it's not for me. I'm going to find some other way. I don't know where. I don't know how. But I'm reading the Bible, and I know that God's going to lead me one day. She said, God's going to lead you. Didn't he lead you to law? I said, yes, buddy. Now he's leading me out of it. Mm. And she pondered that, and she thought about that. And finally, after months and months, and then finally when I made the move out of law and into gospel uh, uh, revival shows in music in Long Island, which I started, mm -hmm. uh, she came to understand that this was God's will in my life and that she couldn't stand in front of it. She couldn't get in the way of it, and neither could anybody else. And at that point, my mother who was of the Jewish faith as well, came over, and she actually started going to church out in California. Praise God. Wasn't that uh, a blessing? Yeah. So, so God trained me in the music, in the world, and trained me in law, in the world, but took me right out so that I was no longer mm. of the world, but still in the world, but mm. this time as his servant, and his minister of the gospel to serve his purposes and his needs. Amen. And Amen. I went from riches to rags. Right. I went from a beautiful apartment in Manhattan to a van on the streets of L.A. for six years, singing and preaching the gospel, as you know, as we talked the last time we met. Right. So it was a I wonderful know, experience. So I also know that you had the, uh, the homeless ministry, as you were saying, the, where you were able to feed about 80 people a day for what six or seven years or something like that for a little less than six years yeah mm -hmm. I became I became the uh, the top dumpster diver in LA if you think Kobe Bryant can jump <laughs> you should have checked me out when I was in good for you <laughs> and I used to I used to go to Gelson's which was a fancy supermarket in mm -hmm. Pacific Palisades mm -hmm. 530 in the morning I pull up there and I grab all this food from the day before that they were dumping in the dumpster mm -hmm. and on the side of the dumpster and flowers mm -hmm. beautiful flowers from their florist shop and I deliver the food and the flowers to the bag ladies and the rest of the homeless in Santa Monica sometimes there were a hundred people congregated in the park there and on Lincoln and, and Wilshire Boulevard mm. and I feed them in the name of the Lord and nobody no one ever knew my name they never knew my name because my name was not important That's right. only the name of Jesus and that was a great blessing for me I did that on and off for six years until they got the crusher, they got a crushing machine that would, mm -hmm. that would ruin all the food, and that was the end of my food ministry. Right. But I continued uh, the ministry. This time, I took it back up to Northern California and stayed on the street, but no longer had the food as one of the vehicles to, to, to make acquaintances mm -hmm. with. I just walked the streets and, and preached to the people that I met and sang. What was the response? The response was very good. I was I became the uh, the singing abalone kid in Mendocino. <laughs> it was uh, it was unusual. You know, the Lord took me from the the cabaret stage and put me onto the street, and I had bookings any time I wanted to, <laughs> and I had street corners galore, mm. and there was never any constraint on my singing for the Lord, mm -hmm. whereas if I had signed with Columbia, right. and if I had signed with John Hammond Sr., mm -hmm. and if I had taken Sid Bernstein, the famous promoter's advice, and gone with him, mm -hmm. he promoted Lennon and the Beatles and all kinds of acts, mm -hmm. I would have been under contract, right. I would have been in bondage, That's right. 
But the Lord delivered me like he delivered the Jews from Egypt. Praise God. And put me on the street and said, Here, Howie, this is your stage, and you're going to sing for me now. And you can sing anytime you want.